His project focuses in clinical psychology. What? I won't say too much about you. Uh, it's a behavioral neuroscience project, and we look at the whole of neuroinflammation. You're going to present. <laughs> <laughs> belonging to Dr. Michael Hennessy and Dr. Patricia Schimmel. And my project is entitled Maternal Separation Alters Prostaglandin E2 Signal. Uh, also, this project was an effort between me and my project partner, Sean McGraw, who recently graduated from Wright State and is now en route to a doctoral program in clinical psychology. This project would not be what it is without him. And so, uh, we are interested in the effects of maternal separation. So why are we interested in the effects of maternal, maternal separation, uh, especially in early life? Because human maternal separation is unfortunately common. Maternal separation unfortunately happens a lot. For example, we're living in a time when kids get separated along the U.S.-Mexico border and also in war situations like we see in Ukraine. Uh, though these are particularly jarring examples, these kinds of events are even more common in separations from things like foster care. This is not only stressful, but this also thought to be what predisposes children to mental illness later in life, which is generally thought of within the framework of the two-hit hypothesis. And uh, this is when early stressful events, the first hit, sensitizes underlying uh, threat-related neural circuitry so that stress-related psychopathology is more likely to occur when facing challenges, the second hit later in life. Stress-related psychopathology includes PTSD, anxiety, schizophrenia, and our particular interest, depression. So we've gotten to the point where we understand that there's consequences to maternal separation. So what is the mechanism of this? And what is the process in the brain? Somewhat surprisingly, data from children as well as animals suggests that the presence of neuroinflammation and that uh, neuroinflammation then alters neural function. And we've had indications for some time that one of the molecules associated with depression is prostaglandins. So if we go back to the title really quick, um, this is a molecule that we're most interested in, uh, prostaglandin E2, which is really just the most prevalent form of prostaglandin. In this study, and there's many studies like this, uh, it found that there was a significantly higher concentration of prostaglandins in the saliva of participants with major depression as opposed to healthy controls. However, this is still not clear. So again, what is the mechanism of this? And what is the process in the brain? And how are we studying this? Uh, in our lab, we use a guinea pig model. Uh, these guys are particularly helpful to studying this topic because unlike rats and mice, they show evidence of a strong maternal attachment Although the idea of maternal separation is sort of a dramatic concept, in reality, we're just putting them in a different cage. 
This is a picture of Sean on site in one of our behavioral testing rooms. And when they're alone and in this brightly lit environment, we look for certain behaviors. Uh, they display two types of behaviors. First, uh, the active behavior, and with time away from the mother, it turns into the second phase, which is passive or depressive-like behavior. And I'm going to show you the criteria for each of these states. First, we have vocalizations. Uh, the y-axis shows how many vocalizations, and the x-axis shows time, uh, 0 to 1 and 1 to 24 hours. And the data shows that over time, active behavior goes down. And this graph is specific to vocalizations. Uh, the same is true with the active behavior locomotion. And then we have passive behaviors, which increase over time. Uh, this is crouch, which is the overall hunch stance. And as you can see, it increases significantly with time. Uh, this is pylorexion, which is their spiky fur, which is functionally a bit like goosebumps. And it also increases over time. And then we have uh, eye close, which also increases over time during a testing period. So when all three depressive light behaviors occur in, within the same minute, uh, it constitutes what we call full passive. And the reason that this is important is because this is what we collect as behavioral data when we observe guinea pigs under the separated, uh, the, some separated three hour conditions. Uh, so these are different figures, and uh, they show that the depressive light behavior we've just seen sensitizes. So when they are separated for two days in a row, which, as we see on the x-axis, uh, one and two, uh, that between day one and two, from the first time they are separated to, to the second time they are separated, there is a significant rise in these depressive like behaviors. So with each separation, we see more depressive like behavior for more of the time. So we have this, we have this established, but uh, why do we think that this behavior is facilitated by a neuroinflammatory response? Uh, this was a study from 2015 in our lab, and essentially it's the same as before, where we have guinea pigs being separated from the mother, and they're showing that with more separations, they show more depressive like behavior for more of the time. Though this time, one of the groups was given a drug which blocks prostaglandins. And as you can see here with the two lines at the top, they still show regular sensitization. And then we have this line at the bottom, which shows that there was a lot less depressive like behavior during separation away from the mother when given the drug that brought blocks prostaglandins. So this is significant. And the drug we used is a common anti-inflammatory called Aleve, uh, which is the um, name brand for the drug, naproxen. This suggests that because we block prostaglandins, we have this drop in depressive-like behavior. And so the inverse may be true, that when prostaglandins are enhanced, we see a regular rise in response in depressive-like behavior, which makes prostaglandins interesting. So before, we didn't have a pathway to investigate the mechanism of this depressive-like behavior, but it's looking like now we have a lead with prostaglandins, which is what we focus on in Sean and I's study. Uh, the main prostaglandin that the drug naproxen blocks is PGE2, which I said earlier is the most prevalent. And in the study I'm presenting, we're interested in finding evidence that the signaling of prostaglandins changes in the brain during the separation which is if we go back to the title, that's exactly what we're looking at. Maternal separation alters central prostaglandin E2 signaling. I hope that's not a spoiler. <laughs> uh, this question stated another way. Uh, in the study, we ask uh, when there is depressive work behavior, and we see more of it with, over time with more separations than are prostaglandins responsible. Prostaglandins are neuroinflammatory molecules, so if this were to be the case that they do facilitate depressive like behavior, then that would be sort of an answer to our question about what the mechanism is of the behavioral response and that neural inflammation is a part of that. But to do that, we're not looking at PG2 directly, we're looking at the gene expression of the proteins and enzymes which make PG2 and then the receptors that it binds to. Uh, first, we look at COX2, which is the first building block in generating prostaglandins. Then we uh, measure for MPGS1, which also helps generate and bind prostaglandins. And uh, each of these leads up to the production of PGE2, which we don't measure directly because it has a short life. Uh, and then there are the receptors themselves, EP1, EP2, EP3, and EP4, and they are all just prostaglandin receptors. 
Uh, and initially, we set out to measure all of these things, uh, but it turns out that we could not locate the gene for the PK3 receptor. So in order to study this, uh, we first have to simulate maternal separation, which again happens when we put them in an observation like this. And so these are our conditions. And as you can see, we have four test groups, an undisturbed group, which, which is never separated from the mother, one set, which is separated once on day 31, and the multiply separated groups, which are three and six separations. These no numbers are chosen for specific reasons. The first groups show the difference between zero and one. So if there's a stressful event, then what are the effects in the brain from this <coughs> one three hour period? And if we were to put this back into the context of the two hit hypothesis, then this would be the initial first contact with stress. Then we have the sensitization groups. Uh, we compare one, three, and six separations to look at sensitization, and these separations would constitute the second hits of the two hit hypothesis. You'll notice that at the end of every condition, uh, condition description, that their last separation period is on day 31, and this is the day that the animals are euthanized and the brains are removed before being frozen via isopentine. Um, we, have to, we have to get to the brains somehow, and uh, once we had them, it was time to actually test the tissue for the molecules we've just explained and worked with our collaborators at Binghamton University. So we took the brains on a road trip. <laughs> yep, that's, that's 48 brains in the back of my Honda, which is not something that happens every day. <laughs> and um, we got to work with uh, Dr. Terry Deek and Dr. Andrew Gore in Binghamton's lab of stress, alcohol, and aging. Sounds like college. <laughs> and uh, here we are in the lab. On the right, you can see Sean uh, working on the cryostat. And on the left, I'm setting a plate. And the cryostat is important because uh, this allows us to, oh, shit, my brains, I should have said something. Um, it allows us to uh, slice the brain precisely in order to locate and punch specific regions which we then test for their concentration of inflammatory activity. So on the left, uh, you can see there's the intact prefrontal cortex, and then on the right, we have the interior hypothalamus punch. Uh, we then perform a technique called PCR on the tissue, which is a way to go in and look at a specific segment of DNA and multiply it millions of times in order to measure its concentration level, which is also known as its level of gene expression. Uh, with higher levels of gene expression, we have higher levels of neuroinflammation. <coughs> so now that I've covered our process, I will move on to our results. Uh, we collected behavioral data and depressive like behavior. We collected behavioral data and depressive like behavior increased with repeated separation. And although this finding was not statistically significant between group, there was a significant rise in depressive like behavior, and it's still been built on this increasing uh, this uh, interesting pattern where guinea pigs show more depressive like behavior for more of the time with repeated separations. And also one more function this serves is that it shows us that we are testing animals that are in a condition that we are interested in. And now for the results of PCR. Uh, we are looking at separation effects. So what are these? Uh, these uh, happen at a single separation, and it's asking whether or not a single separation increases signaling molecules in two parts of the brain. So uh, the separated animals demonstrated by the orange line, uh, you can see that a single separation ramped up COX-2 in the interior hypothalamus, which was significant. And as was the result uh, of the EP2 receptor, which was just shy of being statistically significant, but is still an interesting result. And we saw the same trend with COX-2 being increased in the prefrontal cortex, though it wasn't significant. And although, and there was also a significant finding that in the EP4 receptor uh, increased in the prefrontal cortex. However, for the sensitization effects, uh, in the interior hypothalamus, there was no evidence of sensitization. Uh, although in the prefrontal cortex, in the interior hypothalamus, there was no evidence of sensitization. And although in the prefrontal cortex, we still see that in the group, uh, which was separated six times, which is represented in yellow. 
that they still have numerically more gene expression on each of these measures compared to groups which were separated less. So these are our results for now. And uh, with these results, we can say that maternal separation does alter prostaglandin E2 signaling. And this is the first evidence of a change in the brain regarding PGE2 signaling following maternal separation for this age group. Uh, we're not done with this study. Um, we're still in the process of receiving PCR data from an additional, uh, three additional brain regions. And we'll be looking at the same effects. Uh, and this isn't applicable to humans now, but we believe in the long-term potential for there to be some way that we could provide an intervention to mitigate the effects of trauma on the brain in children separated from their mothers. And while past studies have associated prostaglandins with major depression, our study also provides evidence that prostaglandins are involved in the stress uh, that creates these sensitizing effects and depression. So I uh, want to thank Tisha Sharma, a fellow research assistant, Dr. Emily Dudley, our on-site veterinarian, and our LAR staff. From Binghamton University, I want to thank Dr. Terry Deek for inviting us to his lab, Dr. Andrew Poore. Uh, I want to thank Dr. Molly Deek for understanding the understood PCR, and I want to thank Paige Marsden. From Antioch, I want to thank Dr. Jennifer Grubbs for her guidance and unwavering support as my academic advisor, and I want to thank Dr. Scott Millen for being a resource by sharing their experience in biological research research. I also want to acknowledge our funding from the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development. And give a special shout out to Rachel, who's our master's student. Um, she dealt with all the scheduling and saved our bugs multiple times. Uh, thank you for your conscientiousness and perseverance, Rachel. Uh, and I want to repeat a big overarching thank you to Sean and the lab as a whole. Thank you, Dr. Hennessy and Dr. Schimmel for having me as a lab member and for putting me on such an interesting project. You all have taught me so much. So for now, I will keep this slide up. I doubt I have any time left, but um, <laughs> thank you.
out the way. <laughs> I if I close this, is that okay? And then I will. Oh, well, still gives you some picture. <laughs> Sally, if I just unplug it for a minute, is that okay? Are you scared? Should I not? Uh, I'm holding the flash then, drive. I wanted to stop presenting just while Ashley is giving her first. Uh, go try to finish the monitor. Can you try to finish that monitor? Yeah. Is it there? We have W. I'm Command W. Command W should close window. There you go. We're social science majors, not
the study design was a cross-sectional study um, survey that was carried out from April of this year to May of this year uh, that recruited around 28 participants in the community. Um, uh, it essentially was a anonymous Google survey that was a questionnaire that um, had demographic information, questions surrounding exposure to these topics, and uh, like hard skill questions um, that sort of measured the attitude and biases these people hold. Um, as far as open responses that the students themselves were able to tell us in our own in their own words why they can why they didn't feel that they could uh, go to the or go seek mental health care services, why they feel they had certain biases and attitudes um, surrounding this. Um, so the study uh, first meant to ask two questions. One, have you ever experienced mental health, mental illness that required you or your caregivers to consult a mental health care professional? And have you ever known or shared in giving care to mentally ill persons? This was, supported, this was supposed to separate um, the participants into three groups. Um, a non-exposed group, that was those who answered no to both questions. An exposed group, those who answered no to the first question and yes to the second question. And then the mentally ill group that answered yes to, both, yes to the first question regardless to their answers to the second questions. Um, the next set of questions are long form questions meant to gauge out some understanding of their of stigma, psychology, when mental health care services should be considered. Um, and then we go into the knowledge uh, and attitude toward mental illness and mental service scale. This scale was developed following a study done by um, Psychologist in the city of Saudi Arabia, it's a light card scale, which uh, is a type of psychometric response scale in which responders specify their level of agreement to a statement, typically within five points. Um, there's 23 statements in the survey, and the responses, um, the response options include strongly agree, agree, neither disagree or, uh, or agree, disagree, then strongly disagree, and then the statements are sub summed into three subscales with one final question regarding the participant's decision and if they were to seek mental health support. Um, the subscales are measure the knowledge about mental illness, the attitudes toward mentally ill people, and the attitudes towards mental health care, mental health services. Um, sort of the results, um, primary analysis found that exposed participants had significantly better attitudes towards mentally ill people, mental health care services. So that exposed group um, that was separated showed uh, sort of better or po more positive trends towards um, all these topics uh, apart from the exposed group. Um, yeah, and in their own words, they cited things um, from some form of trauma, whether acknowledged or not, to understanding themselves as others or better because of therapy. And after controlling all the demographic information, like age, sex, uh, residency, education, marital status, um, I still found that the level of exposure to mental illness was not necessarily significantly associated with attitude towards mentally ill, mentally Ill people, but, um, or it doesn't necessarily affect that. It more affected people's decision making, uh, decisions to seeking mental health care services. So it revealed more about that than it did the actual biases people hold, um, which was sort of an interesting thing. Um, and the, the subjects with past history of mental illness were more likely to point um, issues that actually arose as they were seeking mental health care services.
have a handout with the primary results, but I sort of concluded that the current study on the knowledge and attitude toward mental illness in the community of Yellow Springs sort of revealed that about four-fifths of the respondents reported that they had some previous mental illness and that they did currently have unhealthy decisions regarding help seeking. Um, and the study also demonstrated that a larger amount of knowledge and lesser impact on like uh, traditions is associated with the better attitude toward mental health services, which lead to um, better attitudes for mentally ill people and then healthier expected uh, help seeking decisions. Of course, with more time, I would validate the study in order to have more quantifiable results and a key value. Um, this can include more participants, more validated studies on numerous platforms. Um, I would also like to rework the methodology to include more subgroups. Um, but yeah, that's everything. <laughs>
for the front desk, right? Can you give us some other questions too? I'm not yes. going to No, no, no. I have to have a JA about our Oh, well, you're going to do this. Yeah. 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 social and cultural factors have not been prominent in the long history of research on communicable disease transmission, transmission, control, and prevention, even though it is generally recognized that some of these factors did attract the attention of the earliest epidemiologists. Um, to speak to some of the significance of the review of my paper, um, infectious diseases still stand as one of the leading causes of death. Um, Pre-pandemic, it was uh, one of the leading causes for children and adolescents, the third leading cause for death in adults now with COVID. I think it was 20, 2020 was reported that gun violence is, or gun related causes of death is like the highest percentage now. Um, so, uh, combating infectious disease stands at the forefront of public and global health. And the infectious diseases are never only biological in nature, uh, they have cultural importance, of course. Uh, and with that cultural importance, it always needs to be context. Okay, so I won't bore you reading this entire thing, I'll paraphrase a little bit. Um, so first I began with the question that I wanted to explore, like the couplings between the, the fairly new discipline of medical anthropology, which came around in the 1980s, um, and infectious disease research. Uh, but I also wanted to explore how it would work in conjunction with this idea of like a methodical triangulation, um, and try to understand the resourcefulness uh, when planning interventions uh, and interventions inside the spaces of public and global health. So here we have like a brief intro to medical anthropology. As I said, it started in like the 1980s. Um, it's a subfold that draws upon the social, cultural, biological, sorry, linguistic anthropology to better understand those factors which influence health and the overall experience and distribution of health. Um, it works into prevention and treatment. And again, there's social relations of therapy management. So it's kind of all encompassing. So literature review. Um, so I was kind of hard pressed to define a concrete notion of reason. Um, sorry. Sorry. Um, so literature review, there remains a call to action to conduct health research that only not only includes quantitative analysis, but also qualitative efforts. Um, and once that again provide context. And of course there are shortcomings in our research. We're never perfect or have the best objective view or holism. So we can always improve and hopefully by improving we get to the standard of like holism. Um, and of course there's always this anthropological neglect of studying of infectious diseases. Um, so, international health research and the control of infectious diseases uh, from a retrospective. Um, so, post World War II, um, there were innovations, of course, in terms like vaccine. Um, there were some medical scannings, preventative of care, um, such as like spinal bifida, Down syndromes, medical scanning. Um, the point being that after post World War II, there was a spur in the like, healthcare innovation. 
or this idea that the state didn't just have to regulate healthcare efforts. Um, and while there were breakthroughs in medicine, uh, the cultural significance <coughs> or importance of the medicine itself, especially within regards to ethnomedicine, um, still lacked, or this sort of comparison of how different cultures view disease. So to continue, um, with that anthropological neglect, um, there were a few parts. It was in part with the state not lacking for our offering funding, excuse me, um, for social science research. And then anthropology of disease didn't become commonplace until the 1980s. So, with neglect, we're going to talk about anthropological responsibility and the reconstruction of investigative diseases. So, to sort of put for the definition, epidemiologic transition uh, pertains to health concepts uh, such as like population age, distribution, healthcare views. Um, and yeah, while well, medical anthropology casts a lot of etiology, we like to try to use ethnography to you know, understand the cultural, ecological, and also political and economical links that are there in the disease. Um, it's also necessary to investigate historical forces that underlie epidemiological transition. Um, the Sorry. All right. So to my question of methodological triangulation and medical anthropology, um, there's a problem with ethnographic research. We don't necessarily have like a standardized ideal of ethnography. Uh, excuse me, ethnography. Um, I like to think that, especially in the modern age of contemporary anthropology, we like to be more objective or have the holistic view. But um, there are some critiques in the field that we need to standardize that approach. Um, and anthropology also does this thing where um, we see it as like our methodological process um, and the written outcome. The only, excuse me, the written outcome of anthropological research. Um, so this idea of medical methodical triangulation with social science is a combination of strengths using different theories. For instance, if you're an anthropologist, you can use grounded theory or any social scientist, really. Um, and it kind of opens up to strengths, too, because you're able to be critical when looking from a certain discipline. Um, so if you're doing in-depth interviews, direct observation, all of this allows you to, to attempt to minimize weaknesses uh, with the observer effect. So, for instance, this is like, I want to call it like the up and coming or what we could do better, I guess, or to be look at. Uh, using cultural models, because it's from 1996, uh, really prevalent in cognitive anthropology, uh, seeing what, um, it's defined as like the mental framework that people use to think and talk about phenomena. And there's also a really big critique in the field that there's a need for more certificate, so, excuse me, certificate sophisticated models that show. Um, I also added this part about Nancy Krieger. Um, I really enjoyed reading up on like the eco-social theory. I thought it brought a great like component of like race um, to epidemiology, which wasn't there before. And why? So infectious disease dance is a threat to everyone, of course. Um, studying infectious diseases on the micro and macro sociological scales can improve the overall quality of life for everyone. And also, I think it's time, well, excuse me, another critique is that anthropology now functions as part of the interdisciplinary team um, in terms of exploring public and global health. And thank you, I think I'm on time, and that concludes my. Sorry, thank you. Any questions? Maybe, right now? Um, I'm interested in like, what contemporary medical anthropologists like guided you or that you have been most struck by? Because I know we've definitely talked about literature, but I'd just be interested in some of these. Or books. Yeah. Um, not to ask us, but Jennifer Groves is our resident cultural anthropologist, but <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> she has such a great um, objective lens that I think she really, you know, prescribes to every student. And even though you're taking cultural anthropology, you're still looking at like the social and physical determinants of health. Um, to speak to a few that really stuck with me, um, like Farmer, um, while Prager is an epidemiologist, I think she speaks to some of the cultural importance that mm -hmm. is there. Um, yeah, so I'm just trying to see the, you know, the point being that as we move further within public and social health, uh, or excuse me, public and global health research that there is still this need for storytelling yeah. and offering you know, validity to the subject that you're studying. Um, anthropology hasn't always been great about that, but um, 
yeah, I think in the future we'll do a, a better job of, of looking at stuff like that. Did that answer your question? Yeah. I'm sorry. No, Any other questions? All right, thank you. Hello everybody, uh, my name is Jordan, uh, my presentation is about tenant organizing and the housing movement. Um, about me, I'm an organizer with the Party for Socialism and Liberation. We do housing and tenant organizing across the United States. Uh, I recently went to New Orleans to do primary research on this topic and I spoke with um, tenant organizers from PSL in New Orleans and you know, they, they shared some perspectives, but I ended up focusing my project on the New York scene and the LA scene. 
Because that's where it seems like the action is really happening. Um, yeah, but my research paper explores the housing movement and analyzes um, how it affects the material conditions of tenants and of the working class. Um, the housing movement, it's a struggle um, against the ruling class over housing, which is a core human need, but under capitalism it's not considered a right. Um, because of the fact that it's commodified, it means that we have a problem with homelessness, um, which is why in 2017, um, studies estimated that there are about half a million homeless people on the street in the U.S. at any given night. Uh, gentrification is a part of that process, um, where because of development, poor people are pushed out of their neighborhoods. Um, it's a process, it's not a static reality, and it's up to us as tenants to resist it. Um, to address the housing crisis and end gentrification. I argue that a socialist uh, revolution is required to do that. Um, and since that's a complicated process, it's not gonna happen overnight, um, we can still fight for reforms and concessions under the capitalist model. Um, the way to do that is through collective action, not through individualist action. Um, and so tenant unions are a solution that I propose as well as um, organizations. Um, here's some key terms before I go on so that we have a common um, understanding of the vocabulary. Um, rent stabilization is kind of another way of saying rent control. It just depends on the, the area you're in. There's different um, terminology, um, state to state. Uh, major, capital, major capital investments is when the owner of the property make some structural improvements in order to increase the, the property value, which in turn will lead to um, the rent going up usually, is what that means. Um, Yimbyism is a movement that's seen in a lot of um, heavily gentrified areas. Um, that's a popular term in uh, Los Angeles. Um, it's uh, a reference to not in my backyard, but I mean, just in my backyard. It just means they want to see new uh, development um, so in turn, it's kind of like supporting gentrification, um, but it's kind of dressed up to make it sound like it's about being inclusive, and it's um, terminology used by a lot of like liberal politicians to make it sound nicer. Um, and then vacancy control is when a tenant moves out, um, the landlord can increase the, uh, the rent, um, but the vacancy control puts a limit on that sent by the rent control board. And that's something that was gained through the tenant movement, through organizing, that's a, a concession that was able to be passed through to improve the quality of tenants' lives and their material conditions. Um, so, Frederick Engels, the co-author of the Communist Manifesto, theorized about the housing crisis in his time. Um, that theory that he worked on still um, holds water today, and it's used as a framework in this to kind of build uh, a theoretical approach to the problem. Um, so he said that the housing problem is linked to industrialization and urbanization. Um, at the time, uh, Proudhon and Sachs, their theorists at the time, they proposed home ownership on an individual level as a solution. And he critiqued that um, answer. He's saying that's a bourgeois answer. So he said that if the factory owners were to just give the workers homes, then the workers would then just be shouldered with a bunch of mortgage debt, and they'd in turn have to become capitalists. Um, he said that that's not a socialist solution. He said that we can't solve the problems of capitalism with more capitalism. The way to solve it is with socialism. So he proposed collective action and collective ownership of housing as a solution to the housing crisis. Um, so in the 1920s um, in Harlem, New York, um, people thought, realized that the housing crisis was intrinsically linked to racial segregation. And so the Harlem Tenant League was formed with the help of Williana Burroughs. Um, they were connected with the Communist Party USA. Um, they went on to lead giant rent strikes in Harlem and blocking evictions from taking place, um, holding giant rallies and laying the groundwork for the tenant movement that we see today and um, creating a lot of the tactics that we see um, and like demonstrating how that can be used. So that's something that the, the housing movement in New York has been able to build on. Uh, so there's a picture of an early rent strike in Harlem. 
in 1919, the photos from the New York Times. Um, today, uh, in New York, the housing crisis is still a result of inequality and class struggle. Um, last April, rents were up 32% in Manhattan compared to April of the previous year. Um, there was a ban on evictions during the pandemic, which gave um, housing organizers a um, little bit of hope for the future um, that concessions can sometimes be gained under our current economic model. Um, so that's been something that organizers have been kind of building around, um, getting more evictions canceled. Um, like in part of the socialism and liberation, our campaign is uh, cancel the rents. We even go on to say cancel the mortgages um, because revolutionary socialist organizations maintain that housing should be considered a human right and that an eviction is an act of violence. Um, so meanwhile in New York, um, Mayor Eric Adams, he's launched a campaign of harassment against the homeless. Um, there's been hundreds of New Yorkers evicted from encampments by the city of New York. The reason why that is relevant to this is because according to Brooklyn Eviction Defense, PSL, uh, Crown Heights Tenant Union, um, the, the revolutionary socialist housing orgs um, maintain that, ten, that homeless populations are a part of, part of the, um, the class of tenants, as well as people paying a mortgage. So rather than looking at the house, the unhoused, renters, mortgage payers as different groups, uh, a revolutionary socialist approach to the housing crisis says that they're all one class of tenants because we don't have control over our housing is the, the link there. And so the answer to this problem is that we need to unite along those lines, which would make us the great majority of people in New York that would be in the 60 or 70 percent people that don't own control of their housing. Um, and so that's what we mean by collective action. Um, so in Crown Heights, that's a neighborhood in Brooklyn that's owned by developers who don't live in Brooklyn. That area is becoming increasingly gentrified. They've about doubled their population in the last 10 years, but about half their black population. Um, through the process of uh, gentrification, they've been leaving, leaving um, driving poor and working class people out, people of color out, um, through techniques such as harassment, um, all kinds of underhanded tactics to kind of force them out if they can't flat out evict them. Um, and if they can, they will. And so um, Crown High Tenant Union has been organizing in that area, um, working with other organizations like PSL and like Brooklyn Eviction Defense to block those evictions. But there's a, a picture of a, a red strike, um, a rally affiliated with it, um, that involved Brooklyn Eviction Defense, Crown Heights Tenant Union, PSL. That's in a Brooklyn neighborhood. Um, so more about Brooklyn Eviction Defense. Um, they're an amazing organization in Brooklyn. They're an autonomous tenant union, part of the autonomous tenant union network. Um, they were formed during the, um, the pandemic uh, at the end of the moratorium, as that came to an end, um, which was leaving hundreds of thousands of people um, out on the street. Um, Brooklyn Eviction Defense Forum to block evictions by any means necessary. Oftentimes they'll do that through physical um, blocking of the evictions, just not letting anyone come into the home kick the, the tenants out, um, which can even sometimes lead to physical altercations. Um, but they have a very radical um, philosophy on it. They say that um, homelessness is not a natural part of existence. It's a necessary part of capitalism. It's a symptom of class uh, society. Um, and that uh, the housing problem, it's uh, based on the maximization of profit for the wealthy. It only benefits the wealthy. Um, and they say that real solutions to the housing crisis come from organized renters exerting their power collectively. Um, so the housing movement has actually gained some pretty amazing concessions over the last couple of years. Um, in New York, um, Right to Council was passed in 2017. Um, that came from the housing movement putting pressure on the establishment. Um, since the uh, ruling elite and the politicians won't just gift these concessions down, they have to have their hand forced 
Um, so that's what happened. And so right to counsel was passed, meaning that tenant being evicted in housing court has a right to an attorney for free since the majority of landlords have access to an attorney already and tenants do not. Um, prior to this, although there's a huge list of um, rights tenants have, on the books, they didn't have access to them because they didn't have legal representation. So this has been a tremendous um, gain by the housing movement. Um, as you can see, there's been quite the list of concessions just made in the last couple of years. Um, the rent stabilization laws have been expanded. Um, housing Justice for All, it's a collision of housing orgs. They say that the uh, rights of tenants are now more secure than they've been in a whole generation. But yeah, now I want to shift gears and not talk about California since um, the housing scene is completely so different from state to state. I wanted to kind of do like a case study and have like a point of comparison. So the, um, the uh, housing situation in California, it's with housing commons, it's also a struggle of the ruling class against the, um, the working class. It's, um, and also the housing movements found victories there through the same through uh, collective action and through organizing together. Uh, one example is the K3 Tenant Council. Um, the uh, occupants of Air Avenue 55 created a tenants association to address health and safety concerns um, and K3's harassment. K3 is a developing company that owns their neighborhood. They, they don't live in Los Angeles. They're an investment firm. Um, Many of those that are displaced by this firm are indigenous and Latin American residents. Um, it's not by coincidence, this is a continuation of the violence and displacement um, that have been perpetuated against these populations for generations. And it's being perpetuated through um, the business model of um, housing developments like K3. Um, it's the same old story just in the 21st century. Um, which kind of takes me to Yimbyism. It's like the defense in favor of gentrification. Um, so that's become a popular ideology in areas like Los Angeles. Um, they want more development because they support trickle-down economics and trickle-down housing policies. Um, so there's a campaign against that. It's called Public Housing in My Backyard. It's uh, popular with like the LA Tenant Union, for example. They say that they don't have an issue with more housing. That's not the issue. They want. They just want housing that's affordable to working class and poor residents. Is all. Um, so, like, lastly, I want to talk about a uh, very inspiring um, action that took place in the Boyle Heights neighborhood of Los Angeles. Um, so, at Boyle Heights, it houses the mariachi bands. Um, many families in mariachi bands in Los Angeles who've been there for generations. Um, it's actually just a short walk from a place called the Mariachi Plaza, which is named after them. Uh, the irony and the contradiction that this points out is because of gentrification, it's becoming to the point where they can't even afford to live there, and the landlords were trying to get the Mariachi bands out. They um, gave them an 80% rent increase. <laughs> yeah, and then, um, so then they exercised their constitutional rights to try to protest against that, in which, at that time, the person that's supposed to represent the landlord, not the landlord directly, wouldn't meet with them face-to-face, -face, but the landlord's guy, he said, okay, well, here's a three-day eviction notice, you have to get out. So they lawyered up, um, the lawyer said, you know, this is their constitutional right, like, um, tenants have a right to collectively try to bargain, they have a right to uh, defend their livelihood, um, and so, Thanks to the help from the LA Tenant Union, they were able to do that. Um, the judges did listen. They also um, had a massive rent strike, um, with massive protests with help from organizations like the LA Tenant Union. Um, but uh, in the end, they were able to win not only the right to stay, but rent control. They were able to negotiate a deal um, to have rent stabilization in that um, neighborhood. Um, that's been a watershed mo a movement, a watershed moment for tenants in Los Angeles and the housing movement as a whole. Um, because when something like that happens, it inspires others to do the same. So this was 
in the end, a huge victory for the housing movement in Los Angeles. So the mariachi bands got to stay there with rent control, thanks to the power of collective action and organizing. But in conclusion, um, homelessness is a necessary feature of capitalism because surplus value, the basis of profit under capitalism, it demands the immiseration or the making poor of an exponentially growing number of people. So long as profit is the driving force behind housing, homelessness will remain an issue. Housing is a basic core human need, and because it's commodified, it's denied to millions of people in the US and abroad. But the housing movement is how tenants can win back their rights and fight back against evictions. Um, the housing movement has shown us that rights for ten tenants, they can and they should be fought for, and the housing crisis is one that requires collective solutions. Um, and so I passed out um, a pamphlet from the PSL, it's for our Cancel the Rents campaign. Um, there's a Q code in there that will take you to where you can sign up um, to join the campaign. Um, it also has a link to uh, Cincy Tenant um, Union. They have a housing organ in Cincinnati. Um, but if you want, are interested in organizing in your area, there's people you can contact that will help you. Um, we have professional organizers that are working around the clock to be able to help with these struggles. We got people with decades of experience in the struggle that can help you um, uh, step by step, they can answer your questions, and they can send people down and give you assistance in the struggle. Um, but yeah, thank you so much. to one um, unhoused person, but I'm, I think that number has gone up by a lot since then. Uh, so I didn't actually include the number because, I mean, I think most of us know that it's just like a lot like um, of uh, abandoned houses compared to um, homeless people. As far as a select um, a revolutionary solution goes, um, I personally favor um, you know, collective ownership of the housing. Um, but the possibilities are really endless what you can do with all that unused property. Um, but the fact that it's sitting there unhoused is the real travesty of it. Yeah, does that answer your question? Yeah, definitely. Okay, thank you. So Dean asked me something similar because um, I know a lot of people that have a mortgage they're paying and still have to like rent out like a room or like they'll have another unit or whatever and they'll have to rent that out. Um, that's not really, you know, I don't consider people like that like the problem because um, usually if you're just trying to rent out a room to pay your own mortgage, that means you're, as far as I'm concerned, part of the tenant class. And so my organization will fight for the rights of those folks as well as we want to also cancel mortgages. Um, I know um, that's not the opinion shared by like everybody on the far left. Um, there's probably some that would say like, oh no, if you own a house, that's like, you know, bad. But I, I don't, I wouldn't be of that opinion. Um, if you own your own house, that's great. Um, you know, and I think that everybody should have that. Like it's a right, um, but housing as a whole, like if you have control over that resource and that you're um, just using that as a, a means of extracting profit, that's more where it becomes like a morality thing. Um, but the bottom line is like, I consider like, we consider mortgage payers like tenants as well. Um, so that's 
um, ethical landlording. I know, like, even in, like, Cuba, you can own, like, an extra property, and sometimes they'll have, like, Airbnb or something, but that doesn't make them ruling class by most Marxist definitions. Thank you. Anybody else have any questions or um, comments? Well, thank you so much. Put that microphone. For youth homelessness in the U.S., um, the introduction, so the study purpose is to examine the, the pro, okay, I'm sorry, I'm nervous. The purpose of the proposed study is to examine the effectiveness of intervention put in place to address youth homelessness in the U.S. Youth homelessness is a national challenge as thousands of youths experience it every day across the country. Thousands of youths are experiencing homelessness across the country. This is associated with various factors including violence at home, lack of or limited support system, social support, and engagement in foster care homes. Homeless youths experience various problems, including behavioral problems, mental health issues, and sexual and physical abuse. 
the government and other institutions have implemented various strategies to end youth homelessness. However, thousands of youth are still experiencing this situation across the country. Several reviews have been conducted to determine the effectiveness of these interventions. However, there is no current review that has been conducted forcing on studies that have been carried out in the U.S. The proposed study will fill the research gap by reviewing the U.S.-based studies to identify the best intervention that will have a positive impact on youth homelessness across the country. A systematic the, this research approach involves identi identifying relevant primary research, relevant primary, uh, analyzing their findings and using findings to answer the research question. Okay, this, the review will include studies that include youth homelessness between 13 and 24 years old who are experienced in the homeless in the U.S. and study that evaluate youth homelessness intervention. Studies will less than half of the study selection will involve several steps. The first step is to identify the relevant record from database searching and other sources. Second, the screening will be conducted to remove duplicates from identified records. Third, the remaining records will assess for eligibility based on the inclusion and exclusion. The remaining record will include the review. So. Data extracted will be evaluated through Okay, so long story short, because <laughs> I did not prepare for this, I'm just keeping it real, I did not prepare, but I did do the review, so <laughs> uh, long story short, I want to do, I'll, in the future I want to open a nonprofit for homeless people for from 13 to 24, and just give them a place so they can be safe, because a lot of people are really going through homeless, especially when I came to Antioch, because I was, they did experience it before, so, yeah, I'm going to my paper, <laughs> but yeah, uh, that would use a, a variety of methodologies, right? And I think that that's a really interesting twist on a literature review. Because you didn't just look at the, the text that was written in psychology on youth homelessness, but you also did an extensive review of the methodologies used to study youth homelessness. And then said, here's how I could intervene and do something different, mm -hmm. right? And I think that that's, a, that's an immense contribution to the literature is to say, here's what's been said on the topic, and here's how it's been studied. I'm curious, if you were to do the study, what would be something that you are distinctly looking for to find out? What's really like the main cause of homelessness? That's what I'm actually looking for. Like, why there are so many homeless people, especially at a young age? Because the age that when I was doing research, they started. It was a lot of young minors. That's like 12, 13. Yes, I want to know what really caused this. Why are these young people out there on the streets? I have a question. Sure. <laughs> so, um, in your findings, in your research. Um, you said you wanted to um, start an organization. Oh, no, yeah, no, I'm not there. Okay. Yeah. Um, considering um, some of the other like practices and other like people have tried to do this, what about your approach would be different? I mean, it would be similar because every 
the every bird that I look that's doing that in the program that does provide housing, they do the same thing that I want to do, housing, food, and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't be much different. It would be similar to other Because those are the things that you identify yeah. that are the important things sh shelter from. Yeah. Okay. I'll and yeah, many young people experience homelessness in the U.S. You experience it there. The U.S. are at higher risk of developing physical and mental health problems, physical and sexual abuse, behavioral problems, and like other basic needs compared to youth in stable housing. Various stakeholders have implemented different interventions. However, youth homelessness is still a national problem. I'm so sorry for this lame presentation. <laughs> but I did the work and I did not prepare for this, so I'm not going to sit here and act like I did. Dublin. And I'm going to show you my presentation. So, my name is Delaney Schlesner Dublin, my pronouns are they, them, and my degree title is Psychology of Social Behavior with a focus in French language and culture as well as a focus in trans global engagement. And the title of my research project is That Strange New Word A History of Empathy in Ohio. So, my paper weaves together psychological understandings of empathy through a linguistic anthropolog anthropological analysis. Empathy is conceptualized as the act of understanding another person's experience by imagining oneself in the other person's situation, even if they have never actually done so. So central themes that I'm going to unpack with a particular attention to empathy and linguistic anthropology are the intrapersonal and intrapersonal development, social influences, and the developmental model outlet. So I use archival research with newspapers, and my analysis contributes to the growing discourse that focuses on the development of language and historical frame. The distinctive development of discourse analysis used here, specifically locating the word empathy in newspapers from 1909 in Ohio, 1909 to 1955 in Ohio, and it interrogates the ways in which empathetic language was used and understood over time. So some examples of these slides are of the clippings of the newspapers that I looked at. So each one of these slides has the word empathy, which you probably can't see from your seats, but I promise they're there. <laughs> so my research is guided by several focus questions. So the first one, what is the social significance of the word empathy in print journals? What is the definition of empathy as presented in different contexts? In what ways does the word empathy appear in newspapers that are published in Ohio from 1909 to 1955? How did the word change and what is culturally significant about this linguistic flexibility? And all of this helps me focus on the changes of not only the definition, but also the positive and personal development that empathy can have to a person. So I've said empathy probably 50 times at this point, but what is empathy? So empathy actually started out from the German word Fline. This German word had to relate to the emotional experience that one would have when relating to an aesthetic experience. So a person would sit in front of a piece of art and whatever emotion, that would be called Fline. Then in 1901, it was translated to the English word empathy, and it had a very similar definition. 
But with changes in culture, as well as in more study in psychology, the definition and the connotation has changed over time. So what is the study of empathy? It weaves together the psychological components of empathy and how it is developed, how it is taught, and how it takes action in the mind. It is not until after World War II that the term empathy begins to appear more periodically in, in popular press. So that's going to be newspaper articles, that's going to be radio, it's going to be an advertisement then. The word was introduced and defined in a way as to understand others and no longer in connection to objects as the original definition and F line meant. So again, we're still talking about empathy. What is empathy and the development of this? Um, if a person can understand what another is going through, thus they are being more empathetic, they can understand people on a larger scale. And by understanding what parts of the brain are simulated and developed, then one can understand situations in a person's daily life. So the two theories that I specifically focused on to kind of prove the point that empathy, yes, is a real thing, is the calming cycle in connection to the emotional, um, is the calming cycle in connection to the emotional connection theory, which just says that um, social instincts are inherent in people and that social behavior is a learned process that is supported throughout life and starts when a child is a baby and with their caregiver. The second is the intrapersonal reactivity index, which is a standardized statistical scale that is used to rate people on the reactions to objects and subjects in an empathetic way. And so there are going to be four parts to this scale. There's going to be personal distress, empathetic concern, perspective taking, and fantasy. And the two that I focus on are going to be perspective taking as well as fantasy. So the methods. I use discourse analysis to understand the study of how words and frameworks work together, specifically in the context of social sciences. This type of analysis allows for a researcher like myself to not only look at what was written on the paper, but also understand the themes and the ideas that are being read between the lines. In addition, I use the theory of reification, which is defined as treating an abstraction con concept or formulation as though it were a real or material thing. So empathy is no longer an idea, it's something that a person can have, a skill or a thing. To explore general themes of empathy in pop media and to better understand the political and social context of a given time period and geographic area, newspaper articles, advertisements, and letters in newspapers from Ohio um, from 1909 to 1955 were studied. And again, these newspapers were all from Ohio. Um, for example, there were some from the Dayton Daily News and also from the Cincinnati Review, just to name a few. The analysis was a qualitative analysis that included discourse analysis to research the text, and it provides additional effects of how language, specifically empathy, can affect people. So some of the resources that I used um, were newspapers.com, which is a newspaper archival um, database, so Toro, the Antioch College Library, as well as other research databases. And I used all the data and open coding analysis to find connection and patterns that would then answer my original research questions. So then the results, after I read um, over 90 <laughs> newspaper articles, which is quite a lot, um, there were four different categories. The perception of empathy, the linguistic component of empathy, the relationship that empathy had in relationships, and the reification of empathy, which again is empathy is a material thing. Um, and those again had sub further subcategories. For the purpose of this study, or for the purpose of this presentation, I'm just gonna focus on two of my main findings because there were quite a lot and I can always talk more in depth, but I only got 15 minutes. So to start off, the two that I will be focusing on are the dynamic shift of perception of empathy over time, as well as the role that empathy has in relationships. So perception, there are three subcategories for this section. There was positive, negative, and neutral perception of the word. So to be positive, it had to be overtly appealing, to have a need for empathy, or to imply that a person needed empathy to be happy or successful in whatever their career or role was. To be negative, it had to be um, overtly fearful, unwant, or that the person was bad as if, if they had empathy. To be neutral, uh, which is the first category that I'll be talking about, it had the least references made, because to be categorized as neutral, it had to say that you needed a balance of empathy. Um, so you could have too much or too little empathy. That would then categorize it as neutral. The majority of articles that were surveyed were positive, with the majority of instances starting in the early 1950s. 
And this is probably in due to the part that there was just a general uptick and larger understanding of what empathy was in the 1950s, um, and also an understanding that empathy was more desirable at this point because you'd be feeling for another person. The next group um, was negative, was the group of negative. And so while this group is quite large, the majority of the, the articles that I found were all from the 1920s. They had a very negative viewpoint of the word, and they would say that it is um, that people who had empathy were, should be beware of empathy, or they were pleading. So it's a very negative connotation. It was said that criminals would invoke empathy in other people. So those were ways to categorize it as negative. There was one outlier in this section, which I think is kind of humorous to talk about. It was in 1954, and it was in relation to an actor who said that empathy was overrated. But I decided to um, include him as an outlier, as a slightly disgruntled actor, so we'll just move on from that one. The last section that we're going to focus on is relationships um, with empathy. So this category focuses um, on part of a relationship that empathy has a role in. This section allows someone to understand the different contexts in which empathy is pre presented. The section has a lot of overlap with the reification of empathy. So for example, the, the relationship that you have with a person is going to be potentially a child to a father. And it will be a skill that the father will develop in the child. And so that is how it is connected to reification. Um, for many of the columns that did talk about this parent-to-child relationship, it was a lot of mothers asking for help with their unruly children or adults talking about current difficulties in their life. And then the author in the newspaper writing back and saying it was in connection to them not having the proper empathy developed when they were a child. So again, it is something that is developed. It is a skill that can be taught and learned. Again, there is a relationship to power and leadership. So in some of the most notable articles, it focused on leaders and saying that empathy was a trait of a responsible, a reasonable, or even a good leader, that people who had empathy would then be more successful in their careers. Um, one of these will show you as a politician, it was very important for someone to have empathy and they were criticizing him for not having empathy, which I found to be a little comical. And most of these instances um, of the relationship with um, relationships were in the 1950s, when again, empathy was seen as a desired trait. So overall, after carefully examining all these newspapers, it is clear that it's not the definition that you should be concerned with, but rather the denotation of empathy. Empathy started out in 1926 as an action that was outright negative. It then had a huge shift in the mid to late 1940s with an even larger shift in the 1950s where empathy was then viewed as an emotion, as a thing, as something that was positive, a skill that people could work towards and people could possess. This was also when the majority of relationships are referenced. So in the future, I think it would be really interesting to go further into the different roles um, that empathy has to play. One example would be to do a critical discourse analysis, which would not only look at empathy as like reading between the lines, the context of empathy, but also looking at the power structures that are in play. For example, I did not research who wrote all these articles. And so it would be interesting to see um, how many were men, how many were women, the pen names of these people. In addition, I did not look at um, the readership of these different newspaper articles, so I didn't see who's reading these articles, and so I didn't know if there was a different makeup from Cincinnati to Dayton um, based on socioeconomic class, race, gender, those sort of things. So that would be um, some research for the future. But overall, I think this demonstrates that empathy quite real is quite real, and we have a positive connotation of it. Um, 
But in terms of the gender shift, a lot of the references in the 1950s had to do with um, finding a mate or finding um, a significant other. And again, these are going to be cis and probably het heteronormative relationships, so male, female. And it was specifically talking to women and telling them, you need to find an empathetic man or you need to be more empathetic towards your children. So that's the more gendered aspect that you started to see. And I'm not quite sure why it was directed towards women, if it had to do with feelings and emotions. Um, if, if that was just the general sexism of the time, I'm not sure. Um, and some of the ideas that I had, that again, need more research about why I went from incredibly negative, something that only criminals should have, um, to something that everyone needs, um, is actually World War II. Um, so during that time, there was a large uptick in just general psychology research. Um, and that was also just when there was a larger uptick of use of empathy in the general public. Um, and so I really do think it has something to do with World War II and understanding others and kind of seeing the atrocities that happened at this time um, and people just wanting to understand others. But again, would need another research, <laughs> would need another year. <laughs> Directions, yeah. Thank you. Yes, Coco. Um, I noticed in some of, or quite a few of the articles that you displayed, um, it's often in connection um, with either a church service or a pastor. Um, and I'm wondering about the connection between, um, you know, like a Christian virtue ethic of empathy, and if you saw that language evolve to become more like secularized over time, um, or not. So this I think would have to play more into um, like the leadership and power. And so it was kind of a prescriptive thing. To be a good person, you should have empathy. And so kind of looking at Christianity very specifically, um, that to be a good Christian, there was even an article that um, talked about to be a good Christian, you needed to have empathy and empathetic Christianity. Um, and so very much kind of concern for other people and caring for others. Um, in addition, the relationship to religion also has to do with gender, which is interesting. There were a few articles that talked about religion, um, and then specifically the sermon would be for young women, and it would be um, how to learn about empathy, and it would be at some church. Um, and so I do think there is a correlation because it also was saying that people who are in power need to have empathy. Um, and kind of if you look at the time, what was the most affluent religion or what was the most normative religion? So, does that answer? Yeah, thank you. Brooke, what's up? <laughs> I love this, this is so awesome. I want to talk about digital tools and how you um, frame your method and so much is exciting. Um, but specifically, you went back to early aesthetics, right? And I think that that's really fascinating that you meandered your way there coming from more contemporary psychological perspective. So I'm wondering, so early aesthetic uh, philosophers were thinking about like the subjective capacity for certain experiences, right? Like beauty or pleasure or terror, and whether they're singular or whether they're universal. And then we kind of move towards um, contemporary psychological discourse around empathy around, you know, it, is it a deficit model? Like do we lack empathy and therefore is this how we can be diagnosed with a certain problem? Or can we build empathy within a developmental model? What are the tools and strategies for helping person, you know, develop the capacity, a better, a greater capacity for empathy and therefore have a better quality of life and relationships. And I think this is really fascinating because they're, um, they're facets of the same question, but they're framed really differently. So I'm wondering, um, just in your opinion, you know, based upon where you have situated yourself in this question, what do you think contemporary psychological research needs to, where does it need to go around the question of empathy? Like, where's the fruitful ground? This is actually hilarious because if you would like another talk about empathy, you can come tomorrow morning when I talk about empathy in French literature. Um, but part of the research that I did in that is a bit more contemporary, and it's looking at um, how difficult it is to feel empathy with an in-group and out-group bias. So it's much easier for people who look like you, who have the same religion, the same culture, to have an, empath to have an empathetic connection with them than for people in the out-group. And I think it's going to be kind of this battle of how do you make people comfortable with the uncomfortable. Um, one of the things that I studied or with my French project um, was looking at fiction reading um, because then if something, if you're reading a fiction book and it's about something that is totally unrelated to you, 
you're going to score higher on that interpersonal reactivity index. You're gonna have more empathy for this person or character that's completely different than yours. And one of the ideas is because your emotions are lower, um, because it's not a real story, it's a fictitious story, and so then you are more easier to be connected. So I think more research needs to go into how do you break down those barriers and how do you change it. Um, so that's kind of my opinion. Thank you. Excellent. Are there any other questions? Great. Thank you so much, everyone. specifically how creative writing can help us do that, and I pursued my own creative writing project as part of my senior project. So I'm just kind of taking you through some of the research and framework that I used, and um, kind of the importance of the project, because the importance of the project is what it's all about. <laughs> um, so my thesis and aims, so the essential idea is that I'm using creative flash fiction to improve mental health literacy and like understandings of mental health and emotions through like examples work. So the entire idea is that um, you can promote education through providing real life examples. And I did a lot of research in terms of like, I wanted to know how mental health literature was used in terms of therapeutic settings. So like in terms of like groups and in terms of one-on-one, -on -one, like do therapists utilize research when they're working with patients and do patients see a difference? So in terms of mental health awareness, I used theoretical perspectives of abnormal psychology. Um, I used positive psychology, which is my favorite, I think, of the bunch, um, and humanistic psychology. Um, Abnormal psych and um, psychopathology were more to focus on mental illness and mental disorders. Um, so I want to address mental health awareness all around and not just confine it to the idea that it's only for people with mental illness and mental disorders. But I also feel like it really does need to be addressed. So in terms of abnormal psychology, that the focus was mainly maladaptive behaviors. And it was a course that I took at Antioch on abnormal psychology that introduced me to this perspective of like, it's not always a disorder, it's not always an illness, it's not always constant. Um, rather, it's this concept of can you function? Like, can you get up in the day and like do what you feel you need to do to have this sense of self-satisfaction? Humanistic psychology is kind of like that idea of this hierarchy of needs, but it also 
touches on this idea of human perfectibility, which I absolutely hated. I was like, that's not possible. Um, but I really liked how positive psych took humanistic psychology and kind of put it in terms of like, there's more to the human experience than what this quantitative research can bring to the table. Um, it was this kind of idea of introducing concepts of like happiness, love, compassion, leisure, self-satisfaction. So it wasn't just about like, have this person reflect on what they think is happening, but rather like understanding that there are these different emotions and experiences to the human experience. Um, mental disorders are characterized by psychological dysfunction um, that can impair individuals. And it's normally marked by a sense of distress in the individual. So basically, if a person is saying like, coming up and saying, I am having a hard time getting up for work in the morning, and it's not that I'm not awake, it's not that I don't want to go, it's that I physically cannot seem to push myself to do it. Um, and it, whether that's because they're terrified of coworkers or um, misunderstood by management, or like you see it all the time in terms of like social anxiety, people just choosing not to show up to classes and work, um, specifically because they don't want to interact with individuals. Um, so I really think that it's important to stress that when I say abnormal and normal behaviors, it's not in a positive or negative connotation because I kind of took it that way when I first started psychology. It has nothing to do because the concept of normal is entirely subjective and that's like very important for me to stress. Um, a lot of what we're looking at is based on social and cultural norms as well. Like this idea of like what is functioning is based on like right now especially in the space we're in, in like this westernized tradition of capitalism and like what it means to function and pursue like monetary gain in society. So my target audience, I specifically wanted to, I was trying to figure out like, do I want to take an adult perspective to this book? Do I want to take um, a younger perspective to this book? And essentially the research kind of led me to my target audience. And that is the fact that most mental illness is diagnosed in college. Um, between the ages of like 16 and I believe it's 26 um, but like 40% of students in 2016 this was in a study from 2016 so <laughs> I'm not sure how accurate it is at the moment but stating that like 40% of college students could meet DSM-5 criteria um, but a lot of that goes undiagnosed and unrecognized and that's kind of what the idea about this is is like awareness like you don't understand something until you actually know about it <laughs> and so like if you're experiencing it and you don't have the words to put to your actions um, it can become very difficult um, so that's where we put on like this concept of emotional literacy into this work um, mentalization is very close to emotional literacy and it's the concept of recognizing the like social motivators of yourself and other people, your goals, your emotions, how people are perceived, like how you perceive individuals. Um, it's all a part of like this putting words to feelings experience and bibliotherapy is actually used in this way in schools because um, it's actually viewed as like a preventative to the diagnosing and counseling of mental illness and mental disorders. Um, so like the idea that if you're informing kids of like what is normal and what is maladaptive behavior, that you'll be able to spot maladaptive behavior quicker and be able to provide treatment to those individuals quicker. Um, so in terms of there was one research article in, in terms of research that really had an impact on me and that was about an adolescent unit. Um, and it was this idea of they had a storytelling literature group in this adolescent unit and they provided specific examples of times when therapists would ask, I want you to come to class or you know, I want you to come to your group with 
um, an excerpt that you identify with, um, and we're going to talk about why you identify with it. Um, I really loved the quote used by one of the examples by a girl, and I used this example in my paper, was, um, I, it, it was a quote by Shakespeare, I cannot heave my heart into my mouth. And the girl picked out this excerpt specifically because she felt she perceived the confidence of her classmates as being much higher than her own. And so when it came time to discuss and have conversations with teachers, she found herself unable to speak how she truly felt. Um, and it was due to like this perceived idea of like everybody has so much more confidence than me, which almost exacerbated the sense of social anxiety that she couldn't speak. Um, and I felt like that example really addresses what literature can do um, for someone's mental health. Like to be able to put words to those feelings and say, it's this idea that like, I can't seem to say what I truly feel even if I am talking, or whether it's this idea of, and I felt like what she was getting at was, how do you just sit there and say like, I'm scared? Like, how, how do you sit there and say, like, to someone when you're supposed to be professional, you're supposed to do all of these things, to just say, it's, it, it, it that's not how it works for me, you know? Um, I really like representations of audio and visual processing disorders in terms of um, mental health literacy, because I myself experienced at Antioch realizing that I had auditory processing issues when I was focused on visual and social stimulation in the classroom. So visual and social stimulation made me unable to comprehend exactly what my teacher was saying, and it reverted to me not using eye contact very much, which made it seem to the professors like I wasn't paying attention. And eventually I had to, by reading some literature, develop a language to explain why I can't look at the professor when they're talking. And the fact that it wasn't that I wasn't engaging, but rather I was taking notes and limiting the amount of visual and social stimuli I had so that I could grasp the concept of what they were saying. So this idea that this can promote advocacy and like push people to be aware that not every motion is immediately describable and that you will have to work to find the language. So now existing literature in mental health um, this is one of my favorite topics, and I have studied it continuously at Antioch. Um, and that's this idea that people have already written existing literature representing mental health. And a lot of these I read as a child and was introduced to in middle school before I truly understood what depression and anxiety and mental disorder meant. Um, Stephen King obviously writes a lot. Um, a lot of his characters experience mental distress um, and a personal dissatisfaction. Um, the most influential book, though, by him for me was non-fictional because it was autobiographical. Um, his on writing, um, A Memoir of the Craft, was extremely like eye-opening because he talks about addiction struggles in this piece and how he actually felt like his creative abilities and his like Liter literature abilities were did, were completely connected to drugs. There felt like a point where he needed to engage in his addiction to be able to write. And like he goes through a lot of like personal experiences or like the fact that despite being sober for multiple years, he will see that somebody has not finished a glass of wine. And he would be like, what is wrong with you? Why wouldn't you finish that? You know, like he still talks about these instinctual urges of mental illness that most people don't understand are not like cut and dry problems. Um, John Green, anything he's ever written really, um, has like a different mental health connotation to it. Um, and if you're looking at the Fault in Our Stars and thinking like, why is that on there? It's about like um, cancer and terminal illness. Well, it's about the mental health struggles that somebody in that situation would face. Um, and I really think that that's actually incredible book specifically because a lot of people don't focus on the mental health of individuals with terminal illness. They just focus on you have this terrible illness that will follow you the rest of your life and that's clearly the problem. But it's like, no, um, 
it leaves me unable to be the person I want to be, which leads to a personal sense of dissatisfaction, which can lead to a whole host of other disorders. Um, and lastly, Stephen Chbosky had a very like big impact on me as a kid because it was one of the first mental health depictions that I saw in middle school. And The Perks of Being a Wallflower is really hard to read and watch, so if that's not your thing, I don't recommend it. But um, Chbosky did something really specific with fiction in that the way that he wrote it, form dictated function. Um, he wanted to show Charlie's perspective, and so he did it through a series of like journal letter entries to this quote, like, dear friend. And it was, whether it was clear as to whether this friend existed wasn't the case, it wasn't the point of writing in this style, it was the point of this idea that he was sharing things, his perspective, it allowed him to flash back into memory without the author having to entirely engage in a change in a setting. He did it in a very like, I'm going to tell you what happened sort of way, but in a way that you had to discern different things about Charlie that you didn't get from the movie representation of this. And that was the idea that in the early beginning of the book, Charlie did not write as well as he did towards the end. So like at the beginning, his sentences are choppy and you notice some misspellings and you notice that he's not diving into certain topics very much. But by the end of the book, you're having pages long entries and really complex, complex sentence structure and vocabulary that adequately describes how he feels. So this idea that literature and in this case music and writing were all compiled in the way that he chose to move forward and the emotional literacy is definitely like shown in this work. So lastly, I'm just going to say that in my piece, I used flash fiction, and that just means that they were short stories, but the point was that they stood on their own. Um, standing on your own is a big part of flash fiction, and I wanted it to feel like, even though multiple characters had multiple stories, that they each had distinct struggles, and that every struggle that they had wouldn't be apparent in every situation. So like the idea of having these environmental triggers. I wanted to be able to show a wide range of people in my piece. I wanted to be able to show a wide range of what they would go through. And flash fiction allowed me to do that without having to connect every single piece of the story together. Um, each of them stood on their own and gave them this sense of like each of them had purpose on their own. Um, I also think that flash fiction relates very much to how trauma is perceived and viewed um, because when you think of traumatic instances, you think more of flashes and like very specific honed in details of the memory you have. Um, and basically, when you do that with trauma, you're kind of creating like this little capture moment, just like you would in flash. And even though your struggles are distinct from each other, they may all connect in some way that makes it a larger piece. And that's why I chose to use flash fiction as my literature um, choice. And these are my references. I'm happy to take questions. <laughs> psychology is that there's so much more to the human experience than we are able to like really quantify um, and the idea that every human experience is just slightly different um, in a lot of ways so this idea that we can have terms like happiness love hope compassion and leisure and all the stuff that positive psychology talks about but positive psychology is also just about understanding that not everybody's perfect, not everybody's going to fit into this mold that you're expected to fit into, and um, it's not all about 
money and function, if that makes sense. It's more about personal satisfaction. It's more about like when you get up and during the day, what motivates you to get up and do the things you need to do. It focuses a lot more on the person, which is why it meant so much to me as somebody who focuses on like mental health advocacy, because it's all person by person. That was really excellent and um, powerful, and I have seen you over the years working in Danelle and doing a lot of work for that se that center and administrative work, and now knowing sort of the, the depth of your thinking behind this, I think it's really um, moving. And I'm wondering, where do you see this these efforts taking you in terms of your career and the kind of stuff that you want to do and the things that you're excited about? So I'd love to continue in working in representation and advocacy. I want to do more work like this because I think research has its place and creative writing has its place. And both can make people feel and think different things. Um, so I want to continue in both. Um, as for this project, I'd like to move forward by making it a full length book. The flash fiction is more um, right now at novella length, but I'd like to, be a, to have an actual book and I'd actually like to print off the final copies that I have for my senior project and hopefully have a couple in panel for people so that I can start putting my work out there for awareness. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I really appreciated you just extrapolating on, um, you know, mental illness and pathologization always being in like the context of a normative subjective hood that's like oppressive inherently. Um, and I really appreciated what you said about like bringing a passage into the classroom to like help students sort of like connect and like find ground in that space. And I'm wondering if um, there are other interventions that you can imagine in like classroom spaces or like dorm spaces. Um, yeah, I know that you've done a lot of that work also in the counseling center. Um, yeah, so actually, um, liter like using literature as emotional literacy was a part of my work at Pennell. Like, I created a book nook that specifically has books relating to a bunch of like different mental health fields. Um, in terms of like other interventions, I've done a lot of events where it's simply a matter of giving individuals space to talk. Um, I think often, as you said, like these idea of like normative concepts. Um, sort of restrict how people are able to express themselves. So specifically dedicating spaces like the Peaceful Place and Pennell to um, have a space where students can either go to be alone or with other people um, is really important. I think space is a big part of intervention, like just holding space. Um, other interventions that I've done are just like sending things out to students. My favorite thing to do at Pennell was we did like a raffle giveaway in which I gave away stuffed animals and plants because I'm like, everybody needs a buddy. So like it was just a raffle um, to get something in somebody's day that made them feel better. Because it's not always about like addressing the bigger picture. Sometimes it's about addressing like the day to day. Yeah. Um, for Flash, it's Flash Fiction. Yes. Um, when you're engaging in that, like with maybe a TV show or something with allegories that aren't maybe as obvious as like the rest of the story, mm -hmm. how would be, or what would be a way that you would use to spot those potential messages? So I think having, that's what um, the adolescent um, group in the research I did was most focused on was like this concept of like group therapy and that people were able to discern different things from different pieces. Um, so this idea that you might not immediately connect with that concept. For instance, my example was that she said that she felt that way to the reading, but it actually made her extrapolate and like reflect on her own experience and started making her realize how her own experience and reflection compared so similarly to the reading. So it's not always about like what the reading immediately tells you, but rather in reflection, how you feel and think after, um, that ends up like providing for the real result. Yes? This is really fascinating. I'll echo Rick and say it's really, um, it's really wonderful to hear a lot of thinking and the research 
research behind you know your approach to writing and psychology. Um, and there was a lot of it segued really nicely from Delaney to you um, in terms of you start talking about bibliotherapy, and I'm, I'm super interested. Um, I'm, I'm wondering, I'm, I'm, for some reason, I'm thinking as you're talking, I'm tracking along, thinking about um, trauma informed pedagogy, right? And thinking about um, um, what instructors need to understand, you know, trauma informed pedagogy and, you know, things like trigger warnings and other things of, um, you know, what do we have to do to ensure that the content and the material we're presenting students isn't um, a re traumatization in, in and of itself to students who are experiencing certain things and how. That's kind of the flip side of the point of bibliotherapy, meaning using literature and using writing to kind of like work through, you know, work through ideas and, and feelings. Um, and I just wonder if through your work in, you know, writing therapy and bibliotherapy and other methods that you've become familiar with, are there implications um, that instructors could use from these kind of canons and the emerging um, Results like what would you want instructors to know about um, how we how we present content and how it can be therapeutic or traumatizing? Do you know what I mean? Yes. Is there any summary things? Um, it's all about or? finding that line, I think, between um, trauma, as you said, traumatizing and helpful. And a lot of the ways that people do that is a lot of mental health trigger warnings, like a lot of mental health books don't have trigger warnings, which I think is something that should change, something that I'm putting in mind as well. It's part of the introduction saying these may not be settling to some readers. Um, but there's also just, if I could say one thing, it's that a singular representation is not enough. Like if you're seeking to talk about this topic in a classroom, addressing one experience in mental health, a narrative, whether fictional or realistic, one is not enough because experiences are so drastically varied and the DSM-5 criteria, I mean, the rules are you have to meet three out of five of these requirements, so not even everybody has the same required symptoms. So I think that if you're addressing that and I think it's very important to just have an open discussion at the beginning of class. And I feel like a lot of professors will talk about readings after, like I, I already read this, now I wanna know what you think. I think it's important to address the topics before giving the reading and being like, is there certain topics in this reading that people feel uncomfortable with and offering something alternative that may not tr be as triggering because everyone has different triggers. around uh, little pieces of paper 
Um, everybody can take one um, if you're interested. Um, I guess I probably didn't print enough for everybody, but um, if you don't get one and you're interested, just let me know. Um, I also printed out what I was going to say today, but I accidentally cut it. I cut up my, my notes when I cut up those pieces of paper, so I'm just going to go off my thumb. <laughs> So I'm Jasmine to Mr. Um, and uh, I did a quantitative analysis of uh, an interview archive, an oral history archive that I made last fall. Um, and that archive is called LGBTQ Plus Experiences at Antioch College. And uh, so that uh, archive is entirely um, LGBTQ Plus Antioch alumni, um, and so we, I interviewed 14, reached out to probably over 20, and um, a couple uh, won't, likely won't be published due to paperwork, and um, people, you know, can decide to retract their interview at any time, so uh, I want to be respectful of that, but we have 10 published uh, just recently, and um, looks like two more will be coming out as well. And so you can find all those interviews, those 10, at the QR code that I distributed. Um, <clears throat> and I really recommend it. I'll talk a bit more about it, but um, you know, I think those, I think all the interviews are really good. Some of them are just a little over 20 minutes, some are like an hour and a half, so, you know, and they're all transcribed, so, um, you know, you can read them, listen to them, both at the same time, you know, whatever. So, uh, the purpose of my analysis <clears throat> um, was to look at, so with the interviews, I was, uh, even with the questions, so there's semi-structured interviews, partially pre-written questions, partially improvised questions. And so, um, with those interviews, I already had some ideas of what I wanted to draw out during the interviews. Um, before I even got into the questions, I was asking about their upbringing, you know, um, you know, where are you from, how did you hear about Antioch, maybe your high school experiences, so on. Um, and then we would talk about Antioch and kind of try and draw out certain things such as like, how did Antioch affect your sexuality and gender, um, you know, uh, how did your co-ops affect your sexuality and gender, those sorts of things. Um, and, uh, and then we also talked about how Antioch affected them post-graduation um, and uh, what, what lasting impact has there been. So already doing the interviews, I noticed some common themes. Um, and so I kind of had an idea of what I wanted to uh, really focus on when I was coding um, the interviews. So uh, to do the qualitative analysis, I went through and I coded the sort of subjects, what they're talking about, um, and also kind of like attitudes about what they're talking about, um, you know, whether it was like appreciation or criticism, that sort of thing, um, which you'll see kind of examples of the codes as I go through the results. Um, and I should also mention, you know, with the participants, there was, of course, certain limitations as always, and so, you know, me being, a white student, a current student, um, a student who, you know, I'm reaching out over the internet, so a lot of them didn't know, you know, maybe whether or not I'm trans or I'm gay or whatever, you know, it's like, that's gonna affect who decides that they wanna participate. Um, and of course, there's the obvious component of like, if you had a negative time at Antioch, you probably don't wanna do an interview <laughs> with a current student about it. So uh, for the analysis, I just did eight of the interviews um, just for time constraints, um, but I will talk about the results now. Um, so already with just talking about the demographics of those who I uh, were included in the analysis, not all of the interviews. Uh, five were cisgender, three were transgender, and two of the transgender um, participants were non-binary, are non-binary. Non -binary. Two are bisexual, and four identified as homosexual, gay, or lesbian, um, and two did not really specify their sexuality. Um, three were people of color, five were white, uh, and then in terms of um, age differences, of course, uh, age doesn't always correlate with when you go to college, but 
Two graduated in 2002, one in 2004, another in 2005, one in 1991, one in 1984, and one did not graduate. Um, she transferred to another school after attending from 2017 to 2018. So that kind of gives you an idea. It's, um, it's pretty spread out. And then two of the interviews I did not get to include were from even um, you know, further back generations. I think they graduated in 1972, 1982, um, something like that. So I, I definitely recommend checking out those interviews as well because it provides a very different perspective. Um, <clears throat> so talking about their upbringing, I'm just gonna point out kind of the commonalities. Of course, each interview is like really unique. Um, you know, I think everybody talked about something that the others didn't talk about, but here I'm just going to kind of point out the commonalities that I noticed. Um, so, four talked about feeling like a misfit or just not fitting in during their childhood or adolescence. Um, and of course, those uh, with the numbers, you know, there are those who may have experienced these things, maybe just didn't mention it in the interview. Um, let's see. Only three said that they had close connections to any or all of their family of origin. And throughout it, um, I kind of draw a distinction between family of origin, your biological family, and your found family, because that is a very, very common theme throughout all the interviews is talking about found family. Um, and two mentioned explicitly a lack of parental support. Um, with uh, experiences at Antioch. Uh, five agreed that Antioch has a radically progressive campus culture, and one disagreed. Um, six described having a sense of belonging while at Antioch. Five developed a found family that lasted or still lasts beyond graduation. Six expressed ex appreciations for the freedom at Antioch to explore one's identity, and so that's a very broad thing, right? Um, some people, it was simply a matter of like, I'm away from my parents and I can do whatever I want. Some other people, you know, it was a matter of like, Antioch's culture, like they never saw transphobia, they never saw homophobia while they were here. And so that gave them this comfort to really explore um, and really, you know, kind of find um, what they would call their true identity. Four expressed appreciation for student agency on campus and or community governance. Um, and so, uh, you know, whether that was talking about COMSOL or iterations before it was even called COMSOL, community council, community governance, um, you know, people appreciated that. Some also expressed criticism at the same time um, of maybe the lack of power, um, but uh, there was also appreciation right along with that for the level of student agency. And again, that also is, people often drew attention to how it's really a double-edged sword of, um, you know, for example, uh, one participant was talking about how when they were a student, you know, there were like students who were residence life coordinators and, you know, these positions that, you know, any other college, you really don't see students in those roles and, um, and how that was, you know, both, a challenge in its own way and also, you know, really kind of prepare people for life after graduation. Um, and I'll also mention, too, we're on the uh, women's rugby team, which was uh, active for a short period of time uh, and uh, is uh, one of the only, I think it's the only Antioch official team that we've, official sports team that we've had in like many decades. Um, and they talked about, each of them talked about how it really like showed them just how different Antioch's culture was from these other schools because women's rugby is very much even not at Antioch, it's a very uh, queer space. Um, and uh, so they saw like, you know, even playing against teams of maybe all lesbians from another school, like it was still like a big cultural shock of like they're singing songs about BDSM and the other school is like, sitting there there's a tradition to uh, like have dinner with the enemy team like after you play and so like singing songs about these things and then the, the other team is just like who are these people <laughs> and then moving beyond Antioch so four described attempting to maintain Antiochian values in their life's work uh, this seemed to signify a regard for ethics and social justice or even pursuing a victory for humanity as stated by Antioch's founder Horace Mann 
um, which I think everybody here is familiar with. But yeah, there was, um, you know, there's also talk of how, what a challenge that can be in our current society of trying to maintain your ethical code in the work that you do and the work that sustains you economically. Um, and then the last result that I'll read, uh, five gave messages that could be categorized. So at the end of the interviews, they were asked, do you have a message for the current and future generations of Antioch students and the current and future generations of LGBTQ plus youth? And so um, five gave messages that could be categorized as just encouragement. One said to be who you are, one said to take care of yourself, one said to be patient with yourself. Um, so there was a lot of positivity um, for uh, the current generations. Um, at least two participants talked about how they really appreciate the younger generations continuing to push the boundaries of what it means to be queer, of what gender means, what love means, sexuality, and so on. Um, and I think that's about it for this kind of the major findings and the results. And um, so at this point, I will say thank you. I've got all three of my uh, very important advisors who helped with this project um, over the course of the last school year, with starting with Brooke, who you know came in, swooped in when we lost our psychology professor, beloved Teo, and Brooke swooped in, called me at like 10 p.m. like, hey, we're gonna do this. <laughs> like, you know, your project, it's gonna have to change, but like, we're gonna do it, it's gonna be great. And here's some options. Um, and, uh, you know, she's helped with that whole process, of course, taught me how to do everything. Um, and then Amy helped in the winter, and Professor Amy Osborne, um, you know, helping me through both preparing for the analysis and also trying to finish up the archive um, as it was just recently published. So I've been working on different archival aspects as I do the analysis. And then lastly, to Professor Jennifer Grubbs, who's given me advising over the course of this quarter and as I do the actual analysis and everything. So yes, I've been very lucky to have help from uh, three great minds. And um, yeah, it's a, it's a great, it's been a great project. And I really hope at least some of you will check out the interviews because I think like I said, all of them are really special. Some of them, like, really, really touching to me personally. And, yeah, uh, and they're going to be there indefinitely. So check them out. Yeah. Any questions? <laughs> questions, anybody? Rick? Did you know that he started? Differences. I, I guess the, the sample is very small from uh, since the reopening versus pre-reopening. But did you notice any difference there? Yeah. So there's definitely um, you know criticism um, from uh, the one student who uh, was here post reopening, um, and so you know the student has had um, you know some negative experiences at Antioch, and I wanted to include that. I wanted to make it clear. I think. Um, there may have been, you know, inherent sort of ideas of like, oh, if I'm going to be doing this interview with a current Antioch student, then I must, you know, have to talk about the good things, you know, and reminisce about all the the great things Antioch has done for me. But, you know, I wanted to make it clear, like, this is for, you know, this isn't uh, an advertisement for Antioch. This is, you know, uh, an archive for of, of queer history, specifically at Antioch. And so, um, yeah, I wanted to include those. And so, yeah, uh, that student had... Um, negative experiences, positive experiences. Um, yeah, they have you know great things to say and, and you know talked about some some hardships that they faced. So um, so yeah, unfortunately, just one student from post reopening. But yeah. Brooke. Um, thank you. This is great. Um, I wonder if you are working on Yeah, um, I think uh, with the collection period, um, it was very general. Like I had no idea what I was gonna find through these interviews. Um, you know, I didn't know. I think I had only 
interacted you know, with one of the participants before doing the interviews. I didn't know what any of them would be like. I didn't even really research who they were post-graduation, although some of them have, you know, pretty fascinating careers. Um, and uh, so, you know, I had no idea what to expect. I was really just kind of like, let's kind of tease out details about, did it, did Antioch affect your gender, your sexuality specifically? Did it, um, you know, did you feel like you were living in an echo chamber, a bubble, as, you know, some, um, people criticize spaces like Antioch for, um, yeah, you know, to, how to co-op affect that whole experience. Just kind of vague ideas of like what I wanted to tease out. And then once I had gone, done all the interviews and transcribed them all and timestamped them, I was like very familiar with kind of what with what each person was talking about. And um, at that point, it became clear like as I'm coding, you know, I could be like, oh yes, this thing that they said, like I heard this in several other interviews or this thing that they said, nobody else said it, but it's still very interesting that they said it, or, you know, certain things like that. So um, I, I knew what I was kind of looking at afterwards during the analysis phase. Um, and uh, yeah, that definitely like, um, yeah, it informed how I read the interviews because then it was like certain things that people had said, I was like, oh yeah, I think that might be a common theme, but then maybe others didn't really talk about it. So yeah, it was uh, a lot easier to go through in the later phases. I'm like, I know these interviews at the back of my head. <laughs> uh, how that affects me going towards grad school. Um, I think, I don't know, I would definitely, it definitely makes me like excited to just like work with a team rather than just like uh, do like coding and transcribing and everything like on my own because at times it was just like, do I know what I'm doing? Like, am I really? <laughs> you know, like, am I qualified, you know, the imposter syndrome, so I think, um, you know, kind of like working alongside other people would have maybe helped with those feelings, um, but, you know, at the end of the day, like, it's, like, because I was, like, I was the one who did every single interview, transcribed every single one, it was, like, I knew these, like, the back of my hand, and it, you know, it just kind of, I'm sure it lowered the total amount of labor hours, or whatever, you know, if you look at it that way. Any last question? Yeah. Um, I mean, I wonder if you have any thoughts just about how this project um, can and will continue to live on, um, also in terms of like supporting the current queer community in Antioch, um, and just like the documentation efforts in, into the present to like celebrate those lineages. Sure, yeah. Um, you know, I'm not sure, like, how, uh, advertisement may take place, like, post my graduation. Um, you know, I, I'm sure Brooke will probably continue doing projects like this with students, and so my hope is, you know, um, if people find themselves interested in that history, then hopefully they'll know, you know, to talk to Brooke, to talk to somebody else who knows about the project, um, you can check it out. Um, and, you know, I haven't spoken with, like, Brooke or anyone about like people perhaps doing more interviews in the future, people who aren't me, um, but you know, that's something that I think could be totally great, a total possibility. I was honestly very surprised when I started the project because it was like, I just assumed something like this would have been done already, you know, and it was like, oh, like there's kind of nothing. <laughs> and so, you know, it, I genuinely would, you know, I would be surprised if we went another decade without someone being like, you know what, like we need to report this history, you know, as it's being made and the recent history. Um, because of course I only got to interview one person from post reopening. So um, yeah, like, yeah, I hope people continue it in whatever way they can. Um, and uh, yeah, just spread the word because I don't know how to advertise after I leave. <laughs> I guess that's it. Thank you, everybody. So we'll, we'll be uh, reconvening at 3.40. Unfortunately, we had a couple students uh, back out on us for uh, the 3 o'clock and 3.20 time slots, um, medical emergencies, etc. Uh, so we'll just take an intermission and um, a final presentation at 3.40. We appreciate it if you attended. Thank you very much.
what? I cannot see anything. I don't, I don't have my glasses on. Oh, I don't have much height. I don't have much height. within the psychology of black women's hair. So this is my very long purpose and thesis. Um, so I said that while plenty of literature is de dedicated to racial identity and self-perception, very little explores how hair may play a critical role in how black women see themselves and others. Black women's self of self-esteem, sense of self-esteem and identity are profoundly influenced by the way they view their hair and the choices that they must make when choosing their hairstyle. These choices can affect how society views them and how they view their own attractiveness and intelligence. The purpose of this research is to understand how black women have redefined girl-centric standards of beauty through their hair care, hairstyles, community, and the journey that was taken to achieve these conversations through film, literature, and studies. By referencing the Good Hair Study conducted by the Perception Institute, I will discuss the biases, stereotypes, and impacts that go along with my historical findings. So one of the topics of research that I can, well that I took from was Stanley Nelson's 1987 documentary Two Dollars in a Dream, and it was the biography of Madam C.J. Walker and her um, just her history and her impact on the Black hair care community, specifically with Black women. So um, Madam C.J. Walker's impact on Black women's identity. Um, so one of the topics that I said was the wonderful hair care girl, which was her product. Um, it helped to shape the black women's sense of self-identity by providing them with access to hair care products. Because before this time, um, black women struggled to take care of their hair. And you know, on the outside world, it, pro it produced biases from other people, um, with like the good hair perceptions and things of that nature. Um, Madam C.J. Walker's impact on black women's self-esteem. So her message and redefining beauty for black women allowed them to feel better, which led them to seeing themselves as more beautiful and allowing others to do the same, thus enabling them to be perceived as more attractive and intelligent, um, which was a big part. I feel like it's a big part of um, just your self-esteem and self-identity in general, the way in which people perceive you. So just her whole message surrounding, you know, the black hair care, um, just allowed her to make black women empower themselves through making themselves feel better. Um, so Madam C.J. Walker impact on the black economy. So the ability to become a sales agent created job opportunities for black women. And before this, um, there weren't any jobs at all for, well, not at all, but, there weren't high paying jobs that Madam T.J. Walker had offered for them um, and also created financial independence for them. So these were some of the um, Walker Asians that she called them. Um, and this was at the school, at the Walker College of Beauty and Culture. Um, so another part of research that I took from was the Black is Beautiful movement. And this was another movement um, which emerged in the 1960s and it represented a shift towards Afrocentric pride and away from Eurocentric conformity. Um, this movement sought to embrace African culture through heritage by appealing to the soul market, which was like the soul train and things like that, where people were liberated in their natural hair. And, and also, wait, let me go over here. So I also had created these terms and definitions in my research just to define what natural hair is, relaxed, protective styles, and the um, terms of beauty and empowerment in the black space, or right, like in this specific topic, because it can vary depending on the context, um, as well as the def definitions such as hair biases, explicit bias, implicit bias, social stigma, identity, and self-esteem. Um, so um, the movement allowed black women to liberate themselves through taking pride in wearing their natural hair without manipulation. Um, 
and I thought that it was a great way to understand the journey that the black that black women's hair has taken because Madam CJ Walker represented nourishing and caring for your hair and now this movement represents it now just embracing what like God had naturally given you on your head um, in terms of making sure that you were aware that that was beautiful and that it can be shown. Um, so at this time, she was the representation of black beauty in her hair. Um, I believe her name is Marsha. I apologize. I did not write her name down. Um, and then also, the influence on the self-esteem, the self-esteem. Um, so the influence of pop culture and media and the impact of representation of embracing natural hair, again, redefining beauty. Um, so figures like, so I guess like in pop culture at that time, it was important for black women to see representation on their screens and in the magazines of black women who were embracing their natural beauty um, and what that did for their mental health and their self-identity and things of that nature. Um, and then also another thing that I speak about in my research is um, the natural hair movement and how that also cultivated like black femininity, black femininity and um, just like the uprising of embracing her na your natural hair. And then these are the definitions again. So within that, I decided to use a study from the Perception Institute, which was called the Good Hair Study that was created in 2016. Um, and it examined the implicit and explicit attitudes related to black women's hair. Um, the study included the Good Hair Survey and the Hair IAT, um, and it assessed women's explicit attitudes towards black women's hair, hair anxiety, and experiences related to their own hair. Um, and it also assessed the implicit attitudes towards black women's hair. So in that, um, they asked some central, well, they had some central questions. Um, in regards to their test subjects or the people who were doing the survey um, on what were the explicit attitudes about beauty attractiveness and professionalism in texture here? Do explicit attitudes about sexual hair differ from generation? Does engagement in a naturalista as activist community affect explicit attitudes? Um, and then for social stigma, it was how do people perceive US attitudes toward textured hair, hair anxiety, um, and this was for black women. Um, and to what extent do women with different hair textures experience concern or anxiety, hair maintenance, or hold negative feelings about one's hair when spurred by exercise, whether intimacy or queries to their hair touch, et cetera. And then the implicit bias question was, does implicit bias related to the texture of black women's hair exist? So in that, um, they had used photos, and the wording that they used was texture styles and smooth styles to refer to natural hair or straight hair or relaxed hair. Um, and they used these photos in the survey to question the subjects on what they felt was most attractive, what they felt looked, made them look most intelligent, and things of that nature. So you can see it's all different types of hairstyles from curly to locks to straight to shorter straight and weaves. Um, so the participant, there were 4,163 participants in their research study. There were 347, 75 men and women, 20% um, black men, 25% black women, 25% white men, 30% white women. Um, in addition to the national sample, 688 women, 68% black and 36% white, were recruited from online natural hair community database to ensure that black women who typically wear their natural hair were included. Um, so the results were that white women show explicit bias toward black women's natural hair. They were rated as less beautiful, less sexy or attractive, and less professional than smooth, smoother hair. Um, and black women in the natural community have significantly more positive attitudes toward texture hair than other women, including black women in the national sample. And then also, millennial naturalistas have more positive attitudes toward textured hair than all other women, and black women perceive a level of social stigma against textured hair, and this perception is 
substantiated by white women's devaluation of natural hairstyles. So this was basically like the bulk of my project. And as I still can, um, work through my research, um, I'm going to form my own conclusions along with my historical evidence and the research that I have found through the good, through the good hair um, perception. Um, so yeah, that's the project you all have questions. <laughs> Thank you very much for attending.